Good morning, Grace Point. It is good to be with you. I hope that Thanksgiving was just as good for you as it was for me and my family. As we transition into a time of the preaching of the word, if we could, could we just pray together and thank God that we get to worship such a glorious Savior who is unstoppable and capable above above all things. Amen? Amen. Father, we love you. Uh, Thank you this morning. We had the opportunity to Uh, worship you and to reflect on that you are capable, that you're a mighty warrior, that you're unstoppable, and that you are mighty to save, and that our Savior, uh, who though he was a man of sorrows, rose victoriously and has redefined life as we know it. Today, as we look at your word and we look at the coming kingdom that we get to be a part of, where we know your presence forever, Would you prepare our hearts to think deeply about what it will mean to know you face to face and be satisfied forevermore? We ask these things in your name. Amen. Well, if you have a Bible, uh, turn with me to uh, Ecclesiastes 3. Uh, If you don't have a Bible, you're welcome to follow along on the screen or the notes inside of your bulletin. We're going to jump around a little bit as we finish our series, Game of Thrones, today. So feel free to use the cheat sheet so you're not jumping around everywhere. Uh, If you are a guest with us today, I want to introduce myself. My name is Robbie Moore. I'm one of the pastors and teaching pastors here at Grace Point. And we are honored to have you with us today as we finish up our series. Uh, If you haven't been with us, uh, let me catch you up on what we've been doing as well as share where we're going uh, in the coming weeks. The series Game of Thrones very simply has been this, us looking at the word of God and seeing where God has manifested his presence with his people. And so week one, Mike Shero talked about that in the garden, we knew God face to face, but because of our sin, Adam and Eve were ejected from the garden, and so that relationship was broken. And so then week two, uh, Jeff preached on the tabernacle, how the people of God knew the presence of God as they wandered through the wilderness. And then last week, Jeff talked again about being a spirit indwelling people, that while God tarries, we have the Holy Spirit inside of us. And what does it mean that we can know the presence of God now, currently. Today, I'm going to talk about when we get to glory and we see God face to face and we know his presence forevermore, I'm going to talk about what that's going to look like. And it all centers around this one simple uh, idea, is that in New Jerusalem or in the new heaven and the new earth, we will know God face to face and we will be satisfied forevermore. In the New Jerusalem, we will know God face to face and be satisfied forevermore. And I'm keying in on the word satisfied because I think this time of year really draws upon that desire to be a part of something significant. The week of Thanksgiving, it's not necessarily the food and the nostalgia or the tryptophan. Uh, It's the reality of being a part of something significant as we gather around the table and as we remember what God has done, as we reflect on all the things we have to be thankful for, what does it produce within us? A sense of awe and wonder. We realize there's something greater than us out there and that desire is really truly from the depths of our hearts a desire to know God and to be known. And the good news is because of Jesus, one day we will see God face to face again that all of this will fade away and what will be left is the very presence of God. So we're gonna pick it up in Ecclesiastes 3, looking at verse 11. He, being God, he has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity into man's heart, yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. Okay, so in in week one, let let me kind of explain what's going on here. In week one, Mike talked about that in the garden, Adam and Eve knew God. They walked with him in the cool of the day, if you remember. And because of their sin, they were removed from the garden. And from that point on, the relationship with God was was fractured. And so we went from being a people who could know God and be in his presence to being removed from it. And so what has happened is we are created with a longing for glory. We are created for a longing to return to that place where there is no more pain, no more suffering, or no more sorrow. All of us want this life to be better or to be fixed or to be whole again. And everybody goes looking for it. 
Uh, The individual who maybe grew up in church and just religiously went to church every single Sunday, they're looking for it. The individual who finds himself every Saturday night in an inappropriate place, right? They're after it as well. Little ears in the room, some contextualizing. They're after it as well. Everyone is after that desire to be filled. That's what Ecclesiastes 3.11 is saying, is that all of us since the garden have a desire to get back to that. And left to our own vices, we all are going after it one way or another. But here's the good news. Those of us in Christ don't have to go looking any longer for that place. We don't have to run after the things of this world, the, the, the inward pull one way or another that, that we feel. When we, when we celebrate holidays or we get around this time of year and we have those moments of, this might taste a little bit like glory. We don't have to wonder, does God have a better place for us? What is true is that he does. And we're gonna use uh, John 14 for the rest of our time together, but I wanted to set up the reality of all of us are looking for that. So if you're here today and you know Jesus or you don't, can I just tell you, he is the only thing that will satisfy that desire in your heart. That's it. There is nothing else that will fill your heart and give you a real sense of worth and satisfaction apart from Jesus. And so if you don't know him, can I just tell you, you're going to keep running, but nothing is going to satisfy you. And for those of us that do, I'm right there with you in the days that are hard and difficult. Let's remember, though, he's the only one that satisfies. So let's look at John 14 together. I'm going to read one through six. You can follow along on the screen. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. And I will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, there's a a lot going on here in these six verses, but what I really want you to notice is that at the very beginning of verse one, what does he say? He says, let not your hearts be troubled. So Jesus is talking to the disciples and he's letting them know, hey, I'm gonna go away. I'm going to go away. I'm not going to be with you forever. And that was going to create a great deal of anxiety in their hearts. It was going to create a great deal of fear of, Jesus, we know what this world is like apart from you. We've seen the miracles that you've done. Why would you go away? And what does he say? He says, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. And he goes on to explain that this isn't the end of the story is that they're tasting just a part of it. But the end is far more glorious than anything they have experienced. Jesus says, look, I'm going to prepare a place for you, and while I'm gone, you can trust in me. See, while we're in the struggle of the day-to-day and the reality of life, our trust isn't in ourselves and our capableness to white-knuckle it. Our trust is in the one who has gone before us and who promises to come again and bring us home. This is what he, Jesus says to us in Hebrews 6, 19. It says this, we have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul. So do not let your hearts be troubled. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain. This is referring to Jesus. This is referring to the work that he has done for us. See, while Jesus tarries and we wait and we long for the hope of of home in heaven, we take hope in the fact that we have a perfect Savior who waits for us in the presence of God. That his sacrifice for us was perfect. And because it was perfect, we don't have to wonder, are we right with God? Because we know we're right with God because of Jesus. That it can't be based upon our efforts or our works. And so we don't have to worry about that. We don't have to stress over, does God love me? We know that he does. And in the day-to-day, when we begin to wonder of what is going to happen, when is Jesus going to return and make all things new? We can take hope in the one who sits in the heavenly places and says, 
All things will be at my feet one day. While I tarry, you take hope. Don't be overwhelmed. Don't be afraid. See, for the Christian, we have a home and we have a hope in Jesus. And particularly, it's why this time of year, we're officially in Christmas, if you didn't notice. Um, It's why this time of year we sing the song, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. It's saying the world is tired and we need a savior. It's reminding us of the one who came and is going to come again. See, in the battle of the day-to-day and in the perspective of what we're going to face and, and what is uncertain, we know what is certain. We have a Savior who is going to come back for us, and he is going to take us home. And so we never have to doubt that. And as he's gone before us, he has done so to create something beautiful for us. It is a home in the very presence of God. John 14, 2. Listen to what he says again. In my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? So Jesus promises to the disciples. He says, look, I'm leaving, but but here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to prepare a a room or a house for you in the very presence of God. See, if if you're a part of the kingdom of God, there are no second-rate citizens, We are sons and daughters of God and the place that he's preparing for us is filled with his glory and his presence so it will be far more significant than anything we've ever seen. Drive through Alamo Heights someday and look at the house and go, I wish, and remember in heaven, it's more glorious than that. That wasn't a shot at Alamo Heights people, just an analogy. (laughs) I wish I lived there, right? Um, But it's highlighting the fact that we all desire glory. And the home that Jesus is preparing for us is far better than anything we could think or we could imagine. And here's why it's so great and so important to us. Don't miss that. The home we have is gonna be incredible. But the reason why is because the reality that we lost in the garden will be restored. The significance of heaven and the significance of our home is not that it's without pain and not that it's without suffering. It is all those things, but it is glorious because Jesus will be there. Heaven is not heaven if Jesus isn't there. And the home that we long for and the home that we desire that he's created for us will be wonderful and and full of peace and joy and satisfaction because Jesus, our king, will rule and reign there forever and will know his presence. Revelation 21.3 would describe it this way. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, listen, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. See, having the Holy Spirit inside of us is this incredible privilege, incredible gift. But here's what's true. We still live in a fallen world with broken bodies. And so we experience the presence of God, but we don't experience the fullness of it. Even your greatest of moments where you could have cut the room, so to speak, and and just seen the Spirit of God, it won't be as great and as glorious as heaven is going to be. Because in heaven, the dwelling place of God is going to be with man. What we had in the garden will be completely restored. So so where we're at right now, this time period we find ourselves in, two analogies for you, one of which is it's the equivalent of engagement. You've made the commitment, you're all in, but you're not there yet. Or uh, leading up to, again, it's Christmas time, leading up to Christmas, do you remember when you were a kid and you just counted the days down? It was like 20, oh, next day, 19, the worst, right? I mean, it, it just, it took forever. But that's where we find ourselves today. We're one day closer, and yes, oh, the 25th is coming, but it's still so far away. 
and nothing compares to either the wedding day when we get there or, or, or to Christmas morning. Here's what's true for the Christian. We're on a trajectory to a wedding day where we will know Christ as our bridegroom and we will be his bride forever. We will get to experience God for all of eternity and no longer will we have to to really truly pray and, and ask God to show us his presence and show us his glory. We'll just have to open our eyes and see it because it'll be in front of us forever. There's not gonna be any more pain or more strife or more issues. There won't be any need for encouragement or accountability. You won't come to church to hear a broken person tell you about Jesus. We'll actually get to hear Jesus talk about God himself. We will get the privilege of being in the presence of God for all of eternity. No more pain, no more sorrow, no more suffering. Because God's gonna be our God and we're gonna be his people forever. The dauntingness of eternity shouldn't scare you. It should actually push you to worship because it'll be unwavering, unending joy for the rest of all time as we reside in the presence of God. Now, I said this earlier, but I want to stop for a second and really highlight it, is Jesus is rather exclusive in in how we have this relationship. Jesus says in verse 6, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. I don't know where everyone's at today. There are too many of you to walk and talk to every single one of you, but I'm sure of this. All of us have experienced the longing for eternity. We've experienced the brokenness of not knowing the face of God and his presence, and all of us have found ourselves wondering, how can I really be satisfied? How can this pain and this sorrow that just doesn't seem to go away, how can I know that? It doesn't mean that that suddenly everything changes and everything's hunky-dory and there are no problems. But what it means is we have a living hope who sits in the heavenly places, our good King Jesus, and he is more than capable of all things. We've seen his work at the cross. We've seen him rise out of the grave. We've seen his perfect life lived and we know he's coming again and we trust in him. And And I just want you to understand something is there is no other way to have that desire in your heart be filled apart from Christ. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus, you can keep running after thing, after thing, after thing, but the only truly thing that can satisfy you as a person. His name is Jesus. And, and if you're here, and, and maybe you just had a week where, uh, similar to mine, great time with family, but also just stress at times, where there's a, a feeling of being overwhelmed or struggling of not knowing, well, how about this situation, and what about that, and conflict here, or where you just find yourself going, I just want it to be easier. Jesus and what he has done and where he is guiding us to glory is far more satisfying than anything else. We shouldn't go looking for something else to satisfy us because we have that which is most satisfying. C.S. Lewis has this incredible quote. It's in his book, Weight of Glory. This is a paraphrase, so if if you're a big C.S. Lewis fan, I know. Uh, Basically says... Christians so often are like children. We would prefer to sit and play in the mud when a holiday at sea is offered to us. Let me, let me do it for all the parents in the room. Um, when it comes to our affection, so often we would choose to stay at home with all of our kids screaming at once with all lots of stress when in reality a free trip to Hawaii is at stake. That's what it's describing here. So often, our appetites are far too small when it comes to glorious things. So often, our appetites are too weak, and we don't realize the significance of what God has for us. 
And so in the face of the day-to-day and the struggle, we don't realize that what our hearts truly long for and truly desire has been freely given by God to us through Christ. We don't have to fight for it. We don't have to beg for it. God has completely given it to us. And the picture he gives to us is beautiful. Revelation 22, one through five, describes the picture of heaven where we will know the presence of God. I'm gonna read it to us. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as a crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, through the middle of the street of the city, also on either side of the river, the tree of life, with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads, and night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. See, this is a picture into what heaven is going to be like. See, we see the tree of life again, but this time there's just that tree. We will never have to doubt will we ever be removed from the presence of God because we will only know the tree of life. We see a river flowing through it. Uh, Theologians would say that's referring to the Holy Spirit. That the Holy Spirit is what is bringing life and nourishment. That there's this description of the leaves of the tree are gonna bring healing to the nations. All the sorrow and the difficulty and all the differences that divide us are gonna be restored and we're gonna know the healing and the presence of God. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the lamb will be in it and his servants will worship him. We will know God fully in his presence and we will worship the lamb of God who took away the sins of the world forever. We will be satisfied. Verse five, and night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun for the Lord God will be their light. We're not gonna need a sun to rise and fall. We're not gonna need a lamp. There's gonna be no need to brighten a space or a room because Jesus, our king, light will flow from him for eternity. He's gonna be our steadfast light. There's gonna be no darkness, no pain, no suffering. And the hope goes on a little bit more at the very end. It says, and they will reign forever and ever. The they it's referring to is us. What's scandalous about Jesus is that through the cross and his work in the gospel, he offers to us that which we don't deserve. He makes us a co-heir with him. He says, I wanna invite you into ruling and reigning with me forever. Now, we're gonna lay down our crown and say, well, I'm not worthy of that, but Jesus, regardless, is gonna say, no, 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 you're a part of this. We're not called just to sit around and worship God on pillows of clouds in some sort of euphoric, jovial state. We're actually called to be a part of worshiping Jesus and being a part of his kingdom forever and ever. We're gonna have a role to play in the new kingdom of God. We're gonna get to be a part of something glorious and it's gonna be a kingdom that never ends and our part goes on and on for all of eternity. See, this is what our hearts were created for. This is the longing all of us have. It is to know the very presence of God and God's desire from the beginning was always to dwell with us as his people. That was his desire. And see, the Bible is the story of God redeeming his people and bringing them back to this point where we would know the presence of God in full and we would experience his face again and forevermore we would know him and be satisfied. See, as we leave today, the the thoughts that I was wrestling with is is this. The first one would be is, Strive to condition and lead your heart to what is eternal over what is present. 
if this is what God has called us to, this incredible picture of glory in heaven where we know his presence, don't be satisfied with the weaker things of life. Don't let what is in front of you become more significant than what is ahead of you. The second is we should be a people above all else who have the greatest reason to be filled with joy at Christmas time. We do. We have the greatest reason to rejoice because we have the greatest gift in Jesus and we have the greatest future in Jesus. And so uh, I, my hope and my prayer is that we would be a joyful people who testify of what he's done. Lastly, if, if you don't know Jesus, but you know the longing in your heart, today could be the day where you could find out what does it mean to have a relationship with Jesus. Again, it doesn't mean that uh, life is gonna be easier and all your problems are removed. It doesn't mean you know, that somehow everything is gonna get organized and the path moving forward is simple and easy. But it's worth it. Because we have Jesus and he's everything. And the future that he has created for us and has called us to is far more glorious than any of us could ever imagined. So if you're here today and you don't know Jesus, as the spirit leads you, when I get done praying, our prayer team's gonna be down front. One of them would love to talk to you about what does it look like to have a relationship with Jesus that you might be satisfied. Not because life's gonna suddenly be easier, but because you're gonna know the one who says, Come to me, all you who are weary, and I'll give you rest. And you'll get to find out about the hope and the eternity that he's called us to. Let's pray. Father, you are good, and where, where you are is where we desire to be. And your presence will be full and in front of our very eyes one day in the new heaven and the new earth. And one day we will no longer strive or look after the things that will fill us. We will know you face to face and we will be filled. God, would we be reminded of that truth and as we long for many things in the coming weeks in this holiday season, would we remember what we're really longing for is your presence. And you've given us Jesus that we might have the spirit of God now, but it's a seal to guarantee our inheritance and glory. Would we be satisfied in you? Would we be thankful for you? And in your grace, would we know you more and more and become satisfied in you above all things? We love you, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. We love you guys. If you need prayer to talk to someone, come forward. If not, you're dismissed.